Armed and ready, South Vietnamese Air Force F-5s commence a strike mission. These planes were designed to very specific requirements. They were to be small, lightweight, and low cost. They were the first weapon system developed by the United States government to meet the conditions and requirements of the military assistance program. These planes were designed to be supplied to the United States small allies. Over 20 countries employed them. They were the Northrop F-5 Freedom Fighters. The F-5's development defied current trends in fighter aircraft. Other manufacturers were producing planes that were getting bigger and more complex. With the reappraisal of military needs after Korea providing financial support, the United States was pursuing technology. New avionics, missiles and engines dictated growth in the size of fighter aircraft. But the Northrop company went its own way. Northrop's design team researched the basic question of fighter aircraft and arrived at a set of general requirements. As they saw it, the most important of these was the need to keep the plane small. In a classic case of successful innovation, the reappraisal not only led to the family of F-5s, but has had a much wider effect on the development of fighter aircraft since. The role the plane was built to fill was a humble one, but there was nothing humble about Northrop's little masterpiece. It emerged as a maneuverable and highly effective weapon. These planes are F-5Cs, a rare type. Nineteen F-5s were re-equipped for the US Air Force combat trials in Vietnam. Because of these modifications, they were given the separate designation. They were much better known as the Scotia Tigers. After their USAF action, the modified planes were handed to the VNAF and became South Vietnam's first modern jet fighters. In time, about 200 F-5s were used by the Vietnamese. The Vietnam combat use of the Freedom Fighters confirmed their effectiveness and underlined how much of a difference they made to the operational capacity of a small nation's air force. Orders flowed in to Northrop and F-5s spread round the globe. In action, the Vietnamese pilots' aggression combined well with the little plane's accuracy, particularly in ground attack. The plane's load was small, but the precision of its delivery made up for the lack of bulk. The F-5's successful Vietnam deployment underlined the value of Northrop's development work. The design team's obsessions were vindicated. The planes were simple and easy to maintain. Their reliability gave them an edge over other types. They established the highest operational readiness figures with the lowest maintenance man hours. The F-5's ease of control, stability, maneuverability and accuracy endeared it to its pilots. Unfortunately, it was involved in little air-to-air -air combat and its extraordinary agility in a dogfight was not demonstrated. It would be 10 years after Vietnam before the virtues of the lightweight fighter became more widely recognized. Ironically, this would be especially so in the USA, where the Freedom Fighter was developed. The F-5's development goes back to 1955, when Northrop completed the first phase of its fighter studies. They produced a design, the N-156, to serve as the basis for development of either a supersonic trainer or a lightweight fighter. The USAF was uninterested in anything small as a fighter, 
but the attractions of the design as a trainer could not be ignored. On the 15th of June 1956, the go-ahead was given for the production of prototypes of what became known as the T-38 Talon. On April the 10th, 1959, the first T-38 took to the air in a test series that was remarkable for its smoothness. It was the first supersonic plane to go through testing without a major accident. There were no aerodynamic changes and the plane exhibited no vices. The T-38 came out with an instantly established reputation for outstanding flight handling and forgiving characteristics. After the success of the initial flights, larger orders flowed in, and by October 1959, production was stepped up from two planes a month to 10. Eventually, nearly 1,200 T-38s were built. Meanwhile, the company had continued to develop the fighter version at its own expense, tailoring it to the emerging market with less wealthy American allies. This may have been a gamble, but it was a well-informed one. US defense officials could see the logic of supporting allied nations with equipment. Additionally, it made sense to equip them with combat-capable modern weapons rather than hand-me-downs. An ally with obsolete equipment is of limited use. In May 1958, the company was instructed to go ahead with construction of three prototype N156 fighters. The established T-38 tooling accelerated construction, and the first plane was able to make its first flight only 14 months later. Despite the success of testing, the USAF had no desire for a small plane for its own use and there was no program to cover development for use by other countries. Only two of the prototypes were completed. The third, part constructed, was stored. The US Army became very interested in the N156F for a time, for ground attack and close support. In competition with other aircraft, the N156F demonstrated outstanding capabilities. It also impressed with its reliability and ease of maintenance. But the Army competition was called off. The responsibility for operating such high-performance land-based fighter aircraft is something guarded closely by the Air Force. Therefore, if the Freedom Fighter was to come into US service, it would have to be operated by the USAF. The Air Force had already shown no interest in the plane for itself and was unprepared to operate them for the Army, or let the Army operate them for itself. The N156F project languished. Northrop were very confident that they had a great plane, and everybody who came into contact with it was impressed. However, there were no buyers. In October 1962, the program was formalized. Orders were placed for two versions of the N156F, a single-seat fighter and a twin-seat version to double as a trainer. These were given the USAF designations F5A and B. The partially built third N156F prototype was still in storage and this was completed to the new specifications as the YF-5A. The first flight of the new plane took place on July the 31st, 1963. Northrop test pilot Hank Chouteau took the controls for what proved to be an incident-free flight. As with the T-38 and N-156 trials, the testing program passed without any hitches. Changes from the earlier designs had been few, principally in more powerful engines and increased weapons load. The plane was also given a more rugged landing gear for rough terrain use. Despite the increased load and heavier engines, the F-5 was still tiny compared with other fighters of the day. 
For example, it was about a third the weight of an F-4 Phantom. The key to its size was the power plants chosen for the plane. Northrop's designers had been quick to notice the development of small turbojets. They'd been designed for use in missiles, but the Northrop team saw in them the opportunity to gain significant savings in thrust to power plant weight and also incorporate the safety package provided by a second engine. The two engines were located side by side in the aft fuselage. The F-5 engines each weighed only 570 pounds, including the afterburners, and delivered 4,080 pounds of thrust. With a simple two-point mounting onto built-in overhead tracks, maintenance was so simple that a crew of three could remove and replace an engine in 20 minutes. Part of Northrop's concept had been the importance of simplifying maintenance, and the design incorporated many features which directly addressed this. Further, the plane had little in the way of complex avionics and electronics. The very high operational readiness achieved with the planes is due in no small part to the ease and simplicity of ground handling and overhaul tasks. This is especially noticeable in comparison with other supersonic aircraft. A total of eight aircraft were used in the development and flight test program, and these were soon followed by production models. Initial deliveries were made to the USAF Tactical Air Command at Williams Air Force Base in 1964. Here, US air and ground crew trained on the aircraft. The job of these men would be to instruct foreign servicemen in the plane's maintenance and operation. Each MAP country receiving the F-5 would send a group of pilots and other specialists for a training course. The aim was to have these people return to their homelands, qualified to act as instructors. The F-5s used in this program all carried USAF markings, but were in fact owned by the countries concerned. The first classes got underway in September 1964 with crew from Iran and Korea. US pilots working with the Military Assistance Advisory Group also attended this course. It would be their job to advise F-5 customers on how best to integrate the new planes into their inventories and how best to employ them in the field. The F-5B two-seaters had also passed their testing with flying colours, and they too started to be delivered. They were equipped with dual controls, and the instructor pilot seated well above the forward cockpit could take over if needed. In addition to this training capability, the planes also doubled as attack aircraft. Given the impoverishment of many of the client nations, the plane was designed to cope with rough terrain and rudimentary or non-existent landing grounds. The ruggedness and stability of the little planes was best demonstrated in this type of operation. The limiting of sophistication in the plane may have compromised some aspects of its performance, but for its customers, it was the only option. They found that it ideally matched their capabilities and budgets and gave them a very capable defensive and offensive strike. For most of the air forces in question, this was the first time they had deployed effective modern combat aircraft. One of Northrop's major problems in scaling down a fighter was to incorporate commonality with established weapons in the inventory. Special care is needed in the design of small planes since standard items such as stores pylons and ammunition belts are proportionately large. The bulk of these common systems ultimately sets a minimum practical size for the aircraft.
The F-5A was equipped with two nose-mounted 20mm cannon. 280 rounds of ammunition were carried for each gun. As with all aspects of ground handling, the routines to access, clear, load and arm the guns were simple. Everything was within reach of the crewman standing on the ground. The built-in maintenance simplicity extended to tasks like aiming the guns. With minimal skill levels and a few simple tools required, this was established with little difficulty. The guns themselves were rapid firing, capable of 1,500 rounds a minute. A short burst from two cannon could do a lot of damage. In addition, sidewinder missiles could be mounted on the wingtips to give the little fighter a hefty air-to-air -air punch. With the stability and easy control of the F-5, formidable accuracy with the cannon was achievable. Although the twin-seat B model carried no nose cannon, both versions had seven external store stations. These accommodated a full spectrum of tactical ordnance and fuel. Missiles, bombs, napalm and rockets could be carried in combination as required for a mission. The load could range up to 6,200 pounds. As a tactical support weapon, the F-5 proved its worth repeatedly. The combination of its excellent high and low speed maneuverability, unrestricted visibility, rapid response speed and stability made it an excellent close support and interdiction fighter. On its introduction in 1964, the F-5 made a considerable impact. In 1964 and 1965, the plane captured 85% of the weapons meets in which it was entered. These formal contests took place both in the USA and overseas and pitted the Freedom Fighter against a variety of the West's best frontline fighters. The little plane embodied virtues that made it a real handful to contend with. The initial orders placed by the Defence Department in 1962 totaled 71 F-5As and 15 Bs. Many more orders were to flow into Northrop in the following years. The first F-5s to go into service were activated by Iran in February 1965. By the end of that year, another five air forces had taken delivery of the new planes. In addition, several other significant orders had been placed for F-5 production. The plane was so impressive that several non-MAP countries decided to buy the type themselves. Even as early as 1964, agreements were reached with Norway and Spain, the latter including under license production. In 1965, Canada also decided to buy the Freedom Fighter, once again with production in the customer's factory. Each year, more countries joined the list. Area ruling had been applied to the plane. This concept, developed by NASA, held that the cross-section of the complete aircraft should vary smoothly along its length. The waist given to the fuselage above the wing is in recognition of the additional forward-facing area of the wing itself. It was the area ruling that resulted in the F-5's slimmed hips and the overall smoothness of the aircraft's lines. This was even carried to the point of area ruling the wingtip fuel tanks. The limitations of the F-5 were compensated for by the power and sophistication of the weapons it could employ. With sidewinders and cannon, it was a dangerously competent interceptor. In addition, a new role had been developed for it with the production of a camera pack. Allied with external fuel storage, this turned the plane into a long-range reconnaissance aircraft. In its primary tactical role, 
Four of the big bullpup missiles, or up to 76 rockets, gave a potent ground attack force. All the fuel storage, internal and external, was pressure filled in minutes from a single fuel inlet. This was one of the many ways in which the importance of simple maintenance had been recognized in the design. Over a quarter of the surface of the plane was made up of hatches and removable panels. This ease of access to the plane's equipment was reinforced by the racking of components one deep in the fuselage. All the major components could be accessed and serviced with ease. Special testing equipment was minimal and was itself designed to be rugged, portable and simple to operate. Compared with other aircraft capable of the same operational missions, the maintenance requirements of the F-5 were minimal. This aspect of the plane's design was a total success. The F-5's load was almost 50% of its weight, which gave it the highest payload to weight ratio of any supersonic fighter. With the aerodynamic efficiency of the shape, the limited power of the small engines was able to push the fighter along at about Mach 1.3. Its supersonic capability was not limited by the airframe, but that of the turbojets. The design was capable of much higher speeds, and the limits of the power plants were to be a constant criticism. However, given that the engines had been the key to the small size of the fighter, this compromise was unavoidable. In recognition of the potential of the design in the close support role, the USAF decided to trial the planes under combat conditions in Vietnam. In what was known as Operation Scotia Tiger, 19 aircraft were re-equipped to a USAF standard in 1965. With aerial refueling system, armor plating and jettisonable pylons, these modified planes were designated as F-5Cs. The planes arrived in Vietnam on the 23rd of October and flew their first combat mission within hours of arriving. During the 150-day evaluation, the Scotia Tigers flew more than 3,500 sorties with an average combat load of around 2,500 pounds. Most missions were flown with 500 or 750-pound bombs although a variety of ordnance was delivered. The mission types included close support, interdiction, armed reconnaissance, escort and MIG cap. The F-5s endeared themselves to their pilots and impressed the ground troops with their stability, accuracy and reliability. Amazingly high readiness rates were established. By the end of the trial, practice had reduced the maintenance per flight to 6.5 hours. Northrop's expectation had been 21 hours, and this would have been a reasonably acceptable figure. The mission abort rate was a very low 1.5%. Faced with this sort of evidence, the USAF once again looked at the F-5. The outstanding performance naturally suggested an advanced version to overcome the niggling doubts about its engine power, range, and load. As a variation to the F-5A and B, newer and more powerful engines were adopted. In addition, many of the variations provided for individual buyers were re-evaluated. Any performance enhancements were incorporated into the new design. This work began in April 1968, but was canceled in late 1969 with the announcement of a new competition to decide on a successor to the F-5 for the MAP program. Northrop's entry in this competition was the newly developed F-5 variant forged out of the Vietnam experience. The F-5 was announced as its own replacement, but to lessen confusion and to recognize the changes to the design, new designations were issued. The single-seat version would be the F-5E, and the twin-seat would be known as the F-5F. 
In the fall of 1971, it was also announced that recognizing the work of the Scotia Tigers and their influence on the successful design, the plane would be known as the Tiger II. Given that the word Scotia is Japanese for small, the use of the whole title would have been appropriate. The F-5s were certainly small and tigerish enough. The rollout of the new plane took place on the 23rd of June 1972, and the first flight followed on August the 11th. Progress to that time can be simply measured. In eight years of production, over 1,100 A and B models had been manufactured for service in the air forces of over 20 countries. Northrop's midget had turned into a giant sales success. The F5E engines developed 5,000 pounds of thrust, an increase of over 20%. But some of the additional thrust was cancelled by increases in the weight of the plane. Though the new version had increased power, experience would show that this was still not enough to fully exploit the virtues of the airframe. Lightly loaded and flat out, the E was capable of Mark 1.6, but was more comfortable cruising at high subsonic speeds. The Tiger airframe was basically the same as the earlier models. The fuselage was slightly wider, and there were several refinements to the plane's shape. But the original design work had been so good that there was little alteration needed. The fuselage was all metal with a stressed skin semi-monocoque structure. Some steel and titanium were used in the aft fuselage, but the plane was primarily riveted aluminium. The wings were constructed as one piece, carrying through from tip to tip. This eliminated splices in the heavily loaded members. With the exception of steel ribs supporting the landing gear and wingtip store station, construction was all aluminium. The wing skins were largely shaped with chemical milling methods. The plane's combat sophistication took a leap forward with the addition of a fire control radar system and computer gun sight. This provided target detection, range tracking, and lead computation for the cannon, as well as range envelope calculation for the sidewinders. Air to ground delivery was also enhanced with roll stabilizing aiming references. Several changes were directed at improving takeoff performance. These included air doors to increase airflow and a two position nose gear to add 3% to the angle of attack. With these modifications and the engine's added power, takeoff performance was improved by 30%. Even with these and other changes, Northrop were able to retain 75% of the tooling masters of the earlier models. In service, 40% of the spares and 70% of the ground support equipment remained unchanged. Early F5Es had interchangeable nose sections which allowed a reconnaissance fit to be installed. In 1978, however, a specialized reconnaissance version was developed with a lengthened nose and a variety of options in load. In addition to cameras, this included side and fore scanning infrared equipment and other highly effective and sophisticated modern surveillance and search electronics. Loaded in pallets, the selected fit could be quickly installed for any mission requirement. The recon version, christened the Tiger Eye, retained its sidewinders and a single cannon. Development was funded by the company and resulted in a very competent specialist aircraft. Northrop's radical small fighter had now progressed to become a family of planes. Production had switched smoothly to the new model, and the first F-5Es were delivered by the end of 1973. By 1976, Northrop's sale of T-38s and F-5s had passed 3,000, with orders for Tiger IIs still coming in. T-38 production ended in 1972, with delivery to the USAF of the last of 1,189 aircraft produced. Production of the Tiger II continued for another 17 years. The final E and F models were delivered to the Singapore Air Force in 1989. 
the total number of T-38s and F-5s manufactured was 3,806. The T-38 Talon was the only version of the plane to go into use with the USAF in large numbers. 1,139 were purchased. In 1974, by then a 15-year-old design, it received further recognition with its adoption by the Thunderbirds display team. Replacing the much larger F-4 Phantom, the T-38 brought its characteristic precision and maneuverability to the team. In addition, it was established that the team could operate four talons for the same as it cost to operate one Phantom. The F-5E Tiger II was to be the most prolific model with a range of standards of equipment tailored to the economic capacity of the buyer, many sales were arranged outside the Defense Department MAP sponsorship. These included highly refined electronics packages on aircraft for Saudi Arabia. The Saudi planes with inertial navigation, radar warning, chaff or flare dispensers and Maverick missiles were extremely able fighters. Reception of the Tiger II was mixed. Its virtues were acknowledged, but still the plane failed to win a large USAF order. Again, the F-5 was judged to be lacking power. This penalty imposed by the central concern to keep the weight of the plane down undermined the plane's phenomenal maneuverability and flight handling. Throughout its life, the F-5 was looked down on by many experts because of the idea that it was so underpowered as to be restricted. This opinion ignored a great deal of what the experience in Vietnam taught. A lot of the accepted wisdom of post-career theory had been reversed in Vietnam and the Middle East. Fighter design was based on the idea of supersonic aircraft exchanging missile attacks at extreme range. However, this was unrealistic. In fact, very little air combat takes place at supersonic speeds or at extreme range. Once planes join combat and begin extreme maneuvers, speed is rapidly lost. Old-fashioned dogfighting follows, with aircraft in close contact desperately trying to gain advantage. In these circumstances, the F-5 can outfly almost anything in the sky. The USAF inventory has not had any other plane which shares the F-5 specifications. Perhaps the nearest comparison would be with the Soviet MiG-21. Though the MiG had a more powerful engine and could exceed Mark II, this was its only real advantage over the Tiger. The MiG, though very maneuverable, has had a checkered career, with some of its variants being dangerous. In head-on combat, the planes would be very evenly matched. The greater sophistication of the Tiger's avionics and the reliability of its weapons would have served to even things up. Sales of the F-5E bolstered the capability of small air forces worldwide. Arrangements were made for overseas manufacture adding production agreements with Switzerland and Taiwan. In its role as the military assistance program's basic inventory, it complemented the earlier model's success. A combination of low cost and high efficiency with rugged simplicity was unavailable in any other US design. The strength of the Western alliances was immeasurably increased by the program. Throughout South America, the Middle East and Asia, nations with small economies had their air power transformed. What is surprising is the number of planes sold into Europe. These purchasing decisions, like the Saudi orders, were not economically driven. Countries like Norway, Switzerland and the Netherlands are not impoverished. These nations decided that there was no purpose in the purchase of larger, more complex and more expensive aircraft for roles that the F-5 could easily perform. There was also one communist air force using F-5s. With the fall of South Vietnam, 
the North Vietnamese captured and operated 87 F-5s of various models. These planes were later used with considerable success against Chinese aircraft in border clashes. The final development of the F-5 family was the F-5G. Engines had developed dramatically in the long lifespan of the F-5. More power was available from new, small and lightweight engines. The plane was redesigned with the engine from the F-18, which produced 16,000 pounds of thrust. For the first time, the aircraft was matched with sufficient power, and the result was a further remarkable advance in the F-5's capability. This was the first radical redesign of the plane and was subsequently redesignated as the F-20 Tiger Shark. With power aplenty available, Northrop were able to pack additional capability into the plane. Though larger than its predecessors, it was still a small fighter, but its capacity now stretched comfortably up to Mark II. This was achieved without the loss of any of the F-5's outstanding maneuvering and handling. The work started as a co-production effort with Taiwan, and though a presidential veto was placed on the Taiwan deal, Northrop continued to refine the plane up to 1980. Surprisingly, despite the outstanding ability and competitiveness of the Tiger Shark, no sales were forthcoming. It had overcome doubts about the plane's performance. Its takeoff was outstanding, its electronics fit state-of-the-art, and its price was still low for a high-tech aircraft. Northrop accepted the lack of orders, and the Tiger Shark was abandoned, effectively closing the development of the family of little fighters. Over the years, the qualities of the F-5 and T-38 design have seen the little planes entrusted with some very significant roles. Because of its two seats, speed, stability and agility, it proved to be an excellent chase plane and has played an important part in some of the United States' most significant aviation projects. When the XB-70's tires ignited on landing, the pilot heard about it first from a T-38 alongside. Similarly, it was the T-38 crew who noticed fuel leaking from a broken seal on the space shuttle during one of its glide trials. The role of the chase planes in a test program is an active one. They're not merely observers and recorders of the test plane's behavior. They're in constant contact with the test pilot and are sometimes able to tell him things about his aircraft that he and his instruments are unable to establish. Sometimes, that information is critically important. From the beginning of its career, the T-38 and F-5 design has always displayed impeccable handling and stability. It's always had enough aerobatic ability to please the most demanding of pilots. NASA obtained T-38s for the astronauts to maintain their pilot skills. The little trainers also found their way into many niches in the US, including mission support with the Strategic Air Command, chase and test support for the Aerospace Research Pilot School, range support at Eglin Air Force Base, and their service with the Thunderbirds. The F-5 also resurfaced in the X-29 program. Here, accompanied by a T-38 chase plane, the forward swept wing X-plane is seen during its test series. The fuselage is that of an F-5, with undercarriage from an F-16, melded to the exotic wing and its enhanced maneuverability. The simplicity of construction, strength and aerodynamic soundness of the F-5 suggested its use for such a transmutation. The X-29 is an experiment to establish the face of the next generations of fighters. It's fitting that the F-5 should be involved.
At one time, most exercises were conducted within wings. This meant that pilots were pitted in practice against the same type of craft they were flying themselves. In real combat, this is one of the least likely scenarios. The US Navy developed its scheme to remedy this problem under the acronym DACT for Dissimilar Air Combat Tactics. This has become far better known as Top Gun training. In essence, this training tries as realistically as possible to reproduce combat conditions. In the end, the United States also had a supply of F-5Es. These were aircraft that had been earmarked for the South Vietnamese before their collapse. These 70 aircraft formed the basis for the aggressor squadrons in the USAF equivalent to Top Gun, the Red Flag exercise. Flown by some of the Air Force's best pilots, the F-5 squadrons are a force to be reckoned with. The F-5s are used in part because of their similar characteristics to the MiG-21, and the pilots train in Russian tactics, formations and manoeuvres. In the conduct of the exercises, Nellis Air Force Base becomes a combat deployment for the squadrons involved. This includes the limited support facilities and organisational difficulties to be expected in a combat situation. It's important because they find out what these planes can do in a, in a wartime situation. And that's good practice for both the crew chiefs of the planes and uh, the air crew. Over the period of their use in Red Flag, the F-5s have come up against virtually every frontline fighter in the West. The aggressor pilots are very experienced and have become specialists in Red Flag. However, it's still sobering to note that against the best fighters the Western powers have had over the last 20 years, there's no type that has established a clear ascendancy over the Tigers. Copy that, and it's now 15036, still tracking north. Under contact now, 30 degrees left at 25. Just put off to the north, uh, plus, you got 122 fire for 13, and the other one's five miles north of him. Okay, I got the north guy, I want that guy to the other side there, but thanks. Glad to look at him. Okay, you go as a guy to the south, he's 230 for 10, coming at you. I got him, I got him, he's a measure at this time. So we got some uh, F-4s north of Tunisia Peak. We got the Bandits 150 for 40 miles. You may try to hit over that way. You might you hit it south now. That's fine. We're steady about 170. Okay, the lead just went in a right-hand turn to south. Come hard left, 180. Check on the nose a mile. You got a bogey. 6 o'clock for 6,000 feet. Right. Can you turn in? We're coming out hard on him. Okay, got it. The opponents of the Tigers in these exercises were frontline squadrons equipped with the best aircraft and trained to the highest standards. The electronically assessed red flag kill ratios favoured types like the F-15 and F-14, which are truly awesome systems, against the F-5s. But the margin is small. And if the number of planes shot down is compared to the dollar value of those planes, then the results change dramatically. The red flag exercises with F-5s tend to indicate that a force of Tigers would prevail with a margin against the equivalent dollar value of any other type of plane. This includes types that are far more recent designs. This not only puts the F-5 into a more favorable light, but dismisses many long-established criticisms of this unique family of airplanes. <laughs>